Welcome to Desi Plaza TV. Today is a special day. We have a special person with us. His name is Swami Nikilanand. He his origin is western side. So he is a westerner following Hinduism living in one of the biggest ashram in US which is Radha Madhav Dham in Austin, Texas. We have a privilege to have him in our studio and he's going to speak to our viewers today. Namaskar. Namaskar. It's a great privilege for us to have you in a studio and you're talking to our Desi Plaza TV viewers. And we are very, very curious to know a lot about you. First, let's start with, give us a small intro about yourself. Well, I was born in Canada and uh, in a very small village growing up. And I didn't have any idea about Hinduism growing up. But I had a strong spiritual inclination, you can say like just in general, a desire to experience spiritual happiness and uh, eventually that translated into a desire to know God. And that led to a lot of years of searching and many different things that I tried and I think it was just the natural evolution of my spiritual search that eventually and I ended up with Hinduism and although at the time I wasn't thinking of it as necessarily adopting a religion for me it was more like uh, I just found a knowledge the knowledge of Hinduism was very practical to me it answered a lot of the questions I'd had my whole life and I found a process in Hinduism, a process of devotion to God, a process of meditation that allowed me to come closer to God in a very real way and, and actually uh, experience uh, progress in my spirituality. So for me, it transcended cultural uh, boundaries or, or religious uh, constraints or anything like that. It was just a natural evolution. And then later I kind of realized, oh yes, I'm Hindu. You know, I, if someone asks me now, I'll say, yes, I'm definitely Hindu. I follow Hinduism, I teach Hinduism. But initially it was just like a na very natural uh, interest in the philosophy and the meditation techniques of Hinduism. It's so amazing to see that when you were being a Westerner, getting exposure to Hinduism is a big deal. Mm -hmm. On top of it, not many Indians will become sannyasi. Being mm -hmm. a sannyasi is a tough task. So how did you achieve that being a Westerner? Uh, it was uh, a very, also a very natural process. I really felt like, you know, this was something I wanted. It was something that answered a lot of my questions and it gave me a lot of benefit. And then when I got the chance to travel to India and meet uh, the one who I accepted as my Guruji, uh, Jagat Guru Shri Kripaluji Maharaj, I uh, just went very deep into it. And um, it wasn't my plan initially, but uh, since I, at that time I was still young, I didn't have family commitments. And I just decided that I wanted to make this my whole life. And, you know, people talk of it or they think of it in terms of a sacrifice. For me, it was never a sacrifice. It was just what I wanted to do. So <laughs> I never thought of it as giving up something. I thought of it as getting what I wanted. That's very nice. So you were seeking something and you got the answer. That's right. Being a Hindu and being a sannyasi and following the Hindu rituals and everything. So you mentioned about your guru. So what kind of guidance you got from your guru and how it led you in a path on where you're moving right now? The main thing I think is, is the knowledge, first of all, that uh, he was able to explain in a very systematic way what is the whole Hindu philosophy, the whole foundation of it. And gaining that understanding from him just answered all my spiritual questions. And that getting that foundation then led to a lot of other experiences or, or opened me up to a lot of other experiences. So really, you know, with his grace, with his guidance, and I would say with his example, when you can see someone else who has practically attained what you want to get, then it gives you more inspiration to go ahead and try it yourself. 
every human being or I would say every soul's ultimate goal is to have the self-realization and everyone or walking in the path or trying to get in the path probably for certain people there are many genmas it may take more genmas for them to get into the path even to the self-realization in this cycle being a sannyasi I can understand your overall focus is only on self-realization mm -hmm. but think about people like us we are living in the materialistic world having a family life on top of it we also want to achieve the self-realization give us some guidance on how to achieve it like not compromising our family because we have a commitment mm. so I have a care I have a couple of kids so I cannot just walk away saying that today I want to just go and uh, focus on self-realization goodbye I cannot say that I don't have that option to do it but ultimately my soul is craving for self-realization so how do I satisfy my needs very good question very practical question um, let me start by saying that there are two stages in realization, two main stages. One is self-realization and one is God-realization because Atma is Ansh of Paramatma. So knowledge of the self is a partial knowledge. Knowledge of God is ultimate knowledge and knowledge of God includes knowledge of the self. So I would say the ultimate goal is to know God not just to know the soul. Now, as far as what you say is very practical, that being a sannyasi makes following the spiritual path much more simple, um, much less complicated. You don't have to juggle all the various responsibilities, time commitments. Uh, you just focus on one thing and that's what I have the ability to do which which actually makes me less skillful than a person who's living a family life and integrating spirituality into it which is actually much more challenging so how to do that I, first of all it is possible a lot of people kind of doubt that maybe the spiritual path is just for sannyasis um, certainly I could dedicate more uh, hours in the day to it but that doesn't mean that someone with a family or with other commitments can't find a way to integrate spirituality or uh, the path to God into their life so how to do it there are let's just look at the Gita Shri Krishna talks about two main uh, ways of devoting oneself to God. One is karma sannyas, one is karma yoga. So karma sannyas means you cease all worldly activities and you're just thinking of God. And karma yoga means you're actually physically involved in some worldly activity, work, other responsibilities, whatever it may be, but your mind is in God. So body is in the world, mind is in God, or karma sannyas, both body and mind are in God and you're not engaged in worldly activities. So actually, everybody can achieve some kind of a balance of both of these. So I would say even for a family person, even for a grihasti, you can take little breaks. Even if you have kids, even if you have a job, you can become a sannyasi for a few minutes or a half an hour or an hour and sit and do puja, sit and do meditation. However you dedicate some time to God in your day, you can take that time out. It's your personal time. Even if you have a family, you deserve some personal time. That's your own recharge time. That's your time to connect with yourself and with God. So during that time, you could be progressing spiritually if you're using some kind of process that allows you to attach your mind to God, then you're improving your connection to God and that's spiritual progress. Then you have the rest of the day, could be the rest of 23 and a half hours or <laughs> whatever is left where you're not doing karma sannyas. Even then you can take little breaks, few seconds, maybe at the top of every hour, stop what you're doing and remember, I'm not alone. God is with me. Because the fact is, whether you're a karma sannyasi or a karma yogi, God is always with you. That, you know, that's one of the first tenets of Hinduism. God is omnipresent. In all of God's forms, God is always with us. 
so making that connection just requires us to remember that fact. He's right here, right now with me. So that just takes a few seconds. Your boss can't fire you for looking up from your work for three seconds and just thinking, I'm not alone. Krishna is right here with me. Durga Mata is here. Whoever you think of as your Ishtadev, just remember for a few seconds, maybe on top of every hour, and then go back to your work. And if you want to integrate it even more, kind of keep with you the feeling throughout the day that well, my divine companion is always with me. Even when you're working, feel like you have a friend with you right there. Then your mind stays connected to God throughout the day. That's one technique that we teach, which is very simple. Even a child could practice it, but it allows us to maintain a real connection with God and feel like spiritually centered throughout the day. And then we have to take those mini vacations, take a half hour vacation in your day where you just have a more intense and longer connection with God. And then take a three day vacation sometime and go and visit an ashram, go somewhere like Radha Madhav Dham and have a more extended experience where you can get a deeper recharge and elevate your your spiritual consciousness. So I think in that way you can take little breaks from your responsibilities and boost up your spirituality and at the same time integrate it into your life. Well said, very nicely explained. The concept that we say, Sarvam Krishna, whatever we do, we dedicate it mm. to the God, then that means that it's not us who is doing it. We are not the actors. We are just just a witnesser. If we can mm -hmm. just practice that, we will be able to attain it. That's another being a, very practical way to look at it. Yeah, being a, um, being in the family life and just trying to get there, which is really really nice. And mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of people right now, they are on for materialistic pleasures. They miss the point. Mm -hmm. What is really important for the soul? They don't have the craving from the soul mm -hmm. side, they are craving for the materialistic side. But I hope a lot of people will get to this path because ultimately this is what we want. This is the achievement in our life. It's not the, when we leave the body, we are not going to take anything. Not, none of those material pleasures yeah, are right. going to come with us. That's so right. I hope that people realize that <laughs> part as well. It doesn't matter how busy someone is, how many responsibilities they have, everyone faces the same facts. At the end of life, nothing is going with us. Yeah. So the spirituality is important in everybody's life. It doesn't matter who they are. Mm -hmm. Sannyasi, Grihasti, young, old. Yes. So when you were explaining, you were talking about like realizing self is one part and realizing God is another one. So we say Aham Brahmasmi. Mm -hmm. So we are in search of God inside. We have to go in, in turn, turn towards you and internally look at <coughs> the <coughs> self-realization. That's one of the techniques we follow because mm -hmm. it's Aham Brahmasmi is looking inward. So for that concept, what is your explanation behind it? There are, you know, in the thing about Hinduism is that it explains a very subtle and nuanced and deep philosophy from many different perspectives. So it's actually a divine situation that we're trying to describe into material language and understand with our material mind. So it appears to us at certain times that there is a contradiction. Like someone saying God and soul are distinct and someone else saying God and soul are one and the same. So sometimes it's difficult to reconcile these ideas, but uh, they're both correct statements if you understand the perspective. So from one perspective, God permeates everything and everybody. So what part of me is separate from God? God is everywhere, inside my soul, inside my body. So from that point of view, I am God. God. And, and God is the one giving life to me, to my soul. So I am nothing without God. I don't even exist without God. But from another perspective, God's personality is distinct from my personality. God's personality is so great that uh, our scriptures say, God just thinks 
and the whole universe comes into being. We don't have that kind of power. We set certain goals in our life that we're able to attain, certain goals in our life maybe we go our whole life and we fail to attain. So we're not satya sankalp like God is. We're very limited in our power, in our knowledge, in our abilities. Um, so there is a distinction between us and God. God is the supreme power. He's omnipresent. We're spot existent. So there are differences, but there are also similarities. There is a bheda bhed sambandh. It means there are differences and there are non-differences between soul and God. So depending what perspective you're, you're looking at it from, you could say, Aham Brahmasmi, or you could say, well, I'm surrendering myself to God. So the other person would say, why are you surrendering yourself to God? You are God. <laughs> Both are correct, but ultimately we do have to surrender to God to receive God's grace. Then we could become like God. We could become, we could receive divine knowledge and ultimate bliss with God's grace, which we get if we surrender. Thank you. That was a great explanation on the Brahmasmi verses because there are different, as you said, there are different pathways. Ultimately, the goal is the same, mm -hmm. whether you're following one way or the other. Yeah. So there are many meditation techniques mm -hmm. that are being followed, right? Ultimately, when you're talking about self-realization, everyone talks about do meditation, you have mm. to do dhyan to get there. So there are, what are the techniques you would recommend and what is the easiest one? So that way, as I already mentioned, we are in a super busy lifestyle, mm. okay? If you just tell me that I'm gonna sit one whole day and do it, it's not practical, all right? So what is the practical solution? How long we have to do the meditation and how, fo how much focus we can get quickly and how to do that? So I would divide all the meditations into two main categories. Either meditations on God or meditations on other things other than God. Like someone could meditate on their breath or mm. someone could meditate on uh, trying to relax their body. That's one category of meditation. Other category is trying to meditate on God. And then even in that category, you can again divide it into two meditating on formless God or meditating on the personal form of God. Vedas say Dvevava Brahmano Rupe Murtan Chaiva Murtan Cha. God has two forms or two aspects, Murt and Amurt. So with form and without, without form. form. Same God exists in both aspects. It's not two different gods, the same God. So God is omnipresent as a formless divine truth and God is also omnipresent in all of his and her many forms. It's actually easier to meditate on the personal form than formless because the formless aspect is abstract. It's very difficult to describe even like what because in that formless aspect God's uh, virtues and characteristics are unmanifest. It's called avyakta shaktik brahm. God's unlimited divine powers and characteristics are all there in nirakar brahm, but they're unmanifest. So you can't say nirakar brahm looks like this or acts like this or has this quality. It's all virtueless quality. Nirgun, nirakar, nirvishesh, nothing to describe nothing to grasp with your mind. So it's very abstract and more difficult. But meditating on the personal form of God, what we call Sakar Brahm, is more natural to human mind. We, if someone told you, think of your mother, your mother's form will come in your mind very easily. And what we actually do naturally throughout the day is we tend to dwell upon the people that we're attached to. Their face comes in our mind and we think of their virtues and, and what they look like, how they are. Luckily, we have this same type of uh, opportunity with God because we have the descriptions in our scriptures uh, by saints in Vedas, Puranas. So we know what God looks like, what his many forms are, 
what his personality is like, characteristics, powers, virtues, leelas, things he's done like Krishna's leelas, Ram's leelas. So a person can actually use those as objects of meditation. And then it becomes very easy. It's as easy as thinking of your, of your mother, your father, your friend. You think, oh, Krishna is my friend. What does he look like? Okay, looks like that. And if someone says, well, his form is divine, how can you think of it with a material mind? You say, no, you don't have to worry. It's true that until God realization, you can't correctly conceive God's divine form. Once you get a divine mind, you can. Until then, God says, you don't worry. I have unlimited forms. Whatever form you can imagine, you, that form will also be included in my unlimited forms. So I'm not restricting you. As long as your intention is there that I'm thinking of you, I honor that intention and I allow you, uh, I grace you according to your effort. So it's a very simple and very natural meditation. You just think of his form, think of him close to you, maybe do some kirtan along with it. And like I was saying earlier, think of him with you throughout the day. So we call that rup dhyan, meditating on the form. That's, that's very nice. We have first time I've heard about rup dhyan. I think we will, I think we can have more discussion on rup dhyan. Sure. <laughs>